Hello and good morning from Los Angeles. Good evening from Israel, everybody. We're very excited to have you for our Zoom virtual Israel trip Jeep tour this morning. We are going to let all our attendees come into the Zoom meeting. And once we see that everybody is in, we'll get started. Once again, I want to welcome everybody for joining us. Morning here in Los Angeles, evening, of course, in Israel. We're, we're with our good friend Ilan live in Israel. We'll get to him in a moment. We're going to let all of our participants come into the Zoom meeting and we will get started in just about 90 seconds. I still see folks are joining us, which is great. We'll get started in just a minute. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Once again, this is the Jewish Federation virtual Israel trip Jeep tour of the northern border. And I believe we'll get started. Looks like just about everybody who's here on time is here. I'm sure others will be joining us. I want to welcome you, everybody. Once again, my name is Dan Gold here with the Jewish Federation of Los Angeles. I want to welcome you to our sixth session of the spring 2021 virtual Israel trip. We are very excited to have you joining us today for an exciting, incredible, and truthfully, truthfully mind-blowing program where we're going to get a close-up look of the situation that Israel faces on its northern border with a renowned expert, the best person to do it, and we'll get to that in a moment, the best way to do it. Uh, but before I get started, I just want to have a look, few quick announcements. Uh, I want to, of course, once again, thank our travel partners here in Los Angeles, the World Express Travel, and our travel partners in Israel, IGT Tour Company, for making this session and all of our virtual Israel trip sessions happen. They've helped ensure each one has gone off and been able to come to us live from Israel. Uh, they take such good care of us when we're on our in-person missions, and they've done just the same, of course, on these virtual missions. The, a quick reminder that this program is being recorded, and we'll post it uh, on our website shortly after the conclusion of the program. You can also use the Q&A box to ask questions. We will have time for questions mainly at the end of the hour, uh, the last 15, 20 minutes or so for Q&A, so please use the Q&A box to ask questions. There is also closed captioning for the hearing impaired. Uh, you should see it on your screen now. If you would like, you can actually, uh, you know, you use your Zoom controls to turn that off if you do not need that. Um, once again, I want to thank Ezra from IGT and the whole film crew for making this happen. Uh, the Jewish Federation in Greater Los Angeles identifies and addresses the greatest challenges, needs, and opportunities facing our community, both locally and globally. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic brought us new challenges and critical needs. And in response, we pivoted quickly and dramatically to expand our work, responding to our already and newly at-risk po vulnerable populations in Los Angeles and Israel. We amended our programs and we tried to address those needs as quickly as we could, establishing new programs, providing interest-free emergency education, business loans, dealing uh, social services for people that needed it. And of course, we transitioned to offer uh, virtual programs for families and young professionals, just like this virtual uh, Israel trip. Um, it helps keep us connected to each other here and of course, help us keep connected to our, our homeland when we do virtual Israel trip programs. Uh, today's program, once again, is a, among a series of virtual Israel trip programs this spring that followed our whole incredible lineup of tours and conversations from the summer. All the recordings of past programs uh, and registration for our last few coming up this spring can be found on our website at jewishla.org slash virtual dash Israel. And today's program, once again, we're exploring and traveling virtually through Israel, focusing on Israeli security. And on a previous program, we've already discussed our Federation's partnership with the Israeli Trauma Coalition. So I'll just once again note that our Federation is proud to support the Israeli people, especially those living under the daily reality of threats. And we are hoping that together, we're hopeful that together, we're able to help Israelis manage trauma, but more importantly, continue to build a resilient and strong homeland. And with that, I want to turn it over to our good friend, Ilan Shulman. Ilan leads all of our Jeep rides. When we take dignitaries, when we take educators, when we take all of our uh, groups on our, on our missions to Israel, the one thing we always make sure is on our itinerary is a Jeep ride with Ilan and his team. So we're so thrilled to have Ilan Shulman with us. He's going to tell you about him, about his amazing kibbutz, Marom Golan kibbutz. And I'm going to turn it over to him. You're going to have the ride of your life in the air, on the Jeep, so with that, I turn it over to Kibbutz Melom Golan and Ilan. Thank you, Ilan. 
Of course. Okay, guys, so uh, welcome here to the kibbutz. Uh, we decided to do it here in the area of the dining room, the central uh, part of the kibbutz. Uh, so part of you uh, were here and uh, others, uh, hopefully uh, you will come. So thank you for joining us here in Lagba Omer. And uh, I have to say that I'm standing here without smelling the fires that we usually have in this holiday where the kids are all around the fire. So um, I think that this is part of this special atmosphere of uh, the Golan that we're trying to keep even in a, with the COVID, with the Corona in a year like this. Um, we're trying to show you here part of the Golan Heights in this time of the year when it's all green, full with lupin and other uh, different uh, white flowers. So uh, having the reservoirs and the storks migrating through Israel. And the idea is um, to do a little bit of zoom out, showing you this beautiful area that we're living in before we're getting into uh, issues that are gonna sounds more uh, complicated and maybe a little bit pessimistic. So I think that um, these pictures that we see, this uh, um, air pictures, uh, eventually show us uh, why we fighting and what we fought and fighting for uh, this beautiful uh, landscape that I have to say that I'm very proud uh, to live in. It's not only the kibbutz, but the whole region here in the Golan Heights. Um, during this um, uh, lecture, which part of it is going to be uh, the virtual tour, and uh, part of it I will try to explain about uh, the Civil War will hopefully understand better not only the Golan and how things look from the Israeli perspective, but also how things look uh, in Syria with our new uh, neighbors there um, on the other side. So uh, we'll start our tour with the Jeep from the kibbutz Marom Golan in the Golan Heights. Okay, uh, so hello everybody, and uh, welcome here uh, to Merom Golan. Uh, if you ask me, this is the best kibbutz we have in Israel. So uh, I'm not sure that that's part of the Q&A, but uh, that's the best kibbutz in Israel, and I'm very objective saying that, objectively, uh, and I will tell you why. Uh, before telling about myself, uh, we can see uh, part of the kibbutz. It's the first community established on the Golan Heights after the Six Day War. It's the largest kibbutz on the Golan. When I say large, we're talking about 750 people that consider as a big kibbutz here. And um, it's the wealthiest. Uh, we have here a factory that makes electric engines and electronics. We have two quarries of volcanic rocks, three gas stations, five chicken houses, robotic dairy farm, uh, 1,400 cows for beef, a restaurant, coffee shop, hotel, um, and the farming, which part of it we'll see. So uh, these are the houses here. On the left, Siona, the best nurse ever. <laughs> uh, being a nurse in your own kibbutz, uh, not very simple, so she retired a little bit earlier. Uh, this is kind of a family place, a family place uh, with a nice view of the lake that we have below the kibbutz, which we turn to a reservoir. Uh, we'll get closer. Uh, the wind farm, which is something new. And Mount Hermon. I'm not sure whether you can see it or not, uh, but that's the only place in Israel that actually snows. And don't plan a ski vacation since the ski season usually takes place for something like two or three weeks. But I uh, need to be very lucky to be here in Israel. But uh, uh, it's a nice place with amazing view. In a clear day, you can easily see Damascus. Um, and that's our plan uh, for this tour. Not getting to Damascus, but uh, we'll get pretty close. Uh, we'll go to the Syrian border. Uh, crossing the Israeli defense line. Uh, so a few words about myself. Um, besides the fact that my name is Ilan Shulman, nobody called me Ilan in uh, the kibbutz since we have a few. So uh, 
So my name is Shulman, and uh, uh, I live here. I used to do all kind of kibbutzim jobs, uh, mainly uh, working with the cows. Uh, so in the U.S., we call it a cowboy. Here in Israel, uh, when we say cowboy, so people imagine someone with a boot and the hat. Actually, I had those. So, uh, but uh, we call it different. Boker, cattle is bakal. So uh, I used to do that. That was before the kibbutz privatized. Um, and then I joined the army, as most of the Israelis do. The plan was to serve for four years. Things changed. Um, and uh, I served for seven years. Uh, part of it for the reconnaissance of the paratroopers. Part of it as a company commander for one of the battalions of the paratroopers. Uh, I got released as a result of an injury. Uh, so uh, I got shot in the leg, something that uh, brought me back to the kibbutz in a wheelchair. And then before the privatization, before the kibbutzim changed in this one, particularly, um, it was, you felt uncomfortable to live in the kibbutz without being able to work. I decided to leave and uh, moved to a Haifa area, studied the Middle East studies and Islam. And uh, during the second degree, uh, the civil war in Syria began. I was after most of the rehabilitation so I could walk and uh, started to work as a tour guide. And, um, and we had many uh, American tourists then that asked uh, simple questions as uh, who shall who and why. And we'll turn the camera now to the right, to the east side. And you can see here the fields of the kibbutz now being ready for winter crops that we grow here during the summertime because of the lower temperature being an elevation of 3,000 feet. And uh, I don't know if you can see the structures, but where the higher trees are, we'll get there. Um, that's where uh, Syria, that's where Syria is, which means uh, something like two, three kilometers from uh, the kibbutz. Um, so uh, we heard the shelling and I wondered who shall who and why, who are the groups, what's going on in Syria, what the atmosphere of being now in the streets of these villages that we can see here uh, over the fence. And I can say that a second degree in Haifa University, with all the respect for Haifa University, uh, could teach me that. And um, so I made a decision that I wanna get back to service, something that's quite hard being a disabled of the IDF. And eventually I volunteered to the intelligence and they accepted me. Uh, and I serve in a small unit part of the intelligence. Um, so uh, I will try to share with you uh, things about the situation in Syria, things that we're experiencing here and the Golan Heights uh, from different perspectives. Uh, part of it is a local here, uh, part of it is uh, someone that studied that in the academy, but uh, mostly I would say uh, from the military perspective that could teach me more about, uh, about the street and the way that things work. Um, so our plan is, uh, we'll get uh, very soon to uh, military roads and uh, we'll drive up the volcanoes. Uh, this chain of volcano mountains we have in the eastern part of the Golan uh, today uses the Israeli defense line, which means that uh, we trust the ceasefire agreement that we have with the mountain more than the one we have with Syria. And uh, you will see that these are the strategic locations where the bunkers are, uh, different tanks positions, sometimes even artillery positions. Uh, since we're filming that, so uh, we won't be able to get into the bases and the positions. Uh, today, I would say it's even more sensitive this month, since uh, for the whole month, the Israeli army will uh, do a training here of a war. Uh, this is something that commanded by the chief of staff himself, which by the way was my direct commander when I served in the paratroopers. And, uh, um, and part, of the, part of the maneuver is gonna be here on the Golan Heights. So actually once here we turn right, 
We're getting into a military area. And uh, you will see here that um, even though there are uh, signs here of a careful minefield, um, and you will start to see those yellow signs of danger mines uh, all along the way. In the same time, and look straight ahead and you see a power line for uh, the wind farm and the wind farm and here a few lucky bulls. I say lucky bulls because every bull will get a, something like 50, 60 cows. So uh, we have them here, one of them even very young. And um, you will see the orchards of the kibbutzim, can be my kibbutz, can be other kibbutzim around in this area. Um, vineyard that literally touch the border fence, but all along you will see uh, anti-tanks ditches. Let's look, let's see one of them. It's right here. Uh, you will see uh, anti-tanks landmines. You'll see different positions. Um, so uh, the ditch is over there on the left. The ditch that in order to cross, you have to bridge first. Over the ditch, there's an embankment made from dirt and rocks. And you can see here just in front of it, we have the minefields. Most of the landmines that we see on the Golan planted by uh, the Syrians, uh, 367. So they are 50, 60 years old. I'm not sure how active they are, but uh, of course, uh, as I'm saying, give it a try and find out. Man, don't do it. So uh, don't do it. Uh, eventually, we, we see minefields in big parts of the Golan. And uh, I would say that here are more. These are Israeli anti-tanks landmines that mapped on GPS. So uh, someone know where the landmines are. All of us know at the minefields, and we try to make sure that cows uh, won't cross these fences. Step on a minor mistake and turn to a stake. So that's something that barely happens here. Uh, part of it because of the army that maintained those fences pretty well. But eventually, because of that decision that the Israeli army and the state of Israel made, that we're going to keep here a very fragile balance of civilian use and the military needs. And, uh, and that's the situation today that uh, we have these apple orchards and uh, in the same time, the military fortifications. Regard, regarding to the type of the fortifications and the fact that most of them are anti-tanks. So eventually armies attempt to prepare themselves for the next war according to the lessons of the last one. And the last war that we had with Syria was the Yom Kippur War of 1973. Um, that's when we had uh, the Syrians breaching the border using uh, 1,400 tanks. Uh, once against them stood 177 Israeli tanks. And if I want to be even more accurate, I would say that in the first half an hour of that war, of the Yom Kippur War, we had along the border one brigade, the 188 brigade, with 69 tanks. 69 tanks facing 280 Syrian tanks in the first line, 560 Syrian tanks in the second line, and 500 more in the third line. So those are the 1,400 tanks against, again, in the first half an hour, 69 Israeli tanks. As a result, of that threshold, we eventually lost here only on the Golan Heights. In the first 24 hours of the war, only 500 Israeli soldiers, which included one of the brigade commanders, his deputy, uh, a battalion commander, all the company commanders got killed here in the first, the first day of that war. The first, I would say, 24 hours. Uh, imagine what it means for a soldier being in his tank, seeing Israeli aircrafts, 
been shot down by the Syrians, seen uh, their commander tanks being okay, in heat and burning fire. And that was a, a situation that those soldiers never experienced because those ones that served in the Israeli army in 67, they experienced a victory. So in this case, uh, they found themselves in a very problematic situation and they knew that they have to stay in their tanks, keep fighting since there's no other land. And uh, I would say that that post-trauma of that war eventually designed this defense line in the way that we still see it. But things changed. And here we're driving on a military road and above us is a military installation now being occupied by the reconnaissance of one of the infantry brigades, Vati. Um, and the minefields are here on the left, in this case, circling the outpost. And here on the right side and below us, we drove up the mountain. So we can see more and more of the lands, mostly of my kibbutz, also kibbutz and Zivan, which is not as good as mine. And uh, you can start to see into Syria. Let's try to get that uh, reservoir below us. That small reservoir is still in Israel. But right over the reservoir, we can see ruins among the trees. That's Syria. That was the capital of the Syrian Golan, 367, called Kunetra. It conquered by Israel during the um, Six Day War of 67. Um, and uh, was given back to Syria after the Yom Kippur War in the, during the agreements of disengagement of May 74. Henry Kissinger was the Secretary of the State, and he pressured Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, to give Syria a symbol, to give the President something he can show his people that he managed to achieve during the war. And that's when Golda gave Kunetra back. Uh, with another town in the southern part of the Golan. The Syrians, according to the agreement, repopulated the city, something that's never done. And since then, it used mostly for propaganda against Israel, showing the destruction Israel supposedly made during the Six Day War. And here we just talked about the Yom Kippur War. So you can see one of these tanks that uh, left here since that war. That's a Centurion, it's British made. Those tanks brought to Israel in 56 and used the IDF during the Sinai War of 56, the Six Day War of 67, Yom Kippur, and the first Lebanon War uh, of 82, uh, destroyed by the Syrians during the Yom Kippur War and left here as uh, decoys. Um, in case of a war, it probably wouldn't make the difference whether it's active or not. Even though I think that uh, after almost 50 years in the same location, if they didn't manage to figure it out, they probably won't win the war, but you know, it's still here. So, um, um, regarding to the situation uh, today, and of course we'll talk more about getting closer to the border, um, I would say that um, we're facing different challenges. Um, it's not the Yom Kippur War. We can't talk about brigades of tanks. The Syrian army, which was bigger than the uh, Israeli army, than the IDF, today is smaller. Uh, they have less tanks. Many defected, joined the rebels, got killed, uh, became refugees, displaced. Um, and we're talking today about a small army. Uh, the thing that concerns us more regarding to Syria 
are the different, I will call them NGOs that got into Syria, non-governmental organizations, but not those ones that take care of human rights. Uh, but I would say that I can't call Hezbollah, which is a big organization, I can't call them an army, mostly because of the reason that um, Hezbollah have no tanks brigades, uh, they have no aircrafts, that's from one hand. But on the other, Hezbollah has today 150,000 missiles and rockets that can reach anywhere in Israel. And part of them uh, are pretty accurate, which means that if Hezbollah will decide, they can try and bomb Israeli uh, power stations or military airports uh, or different bases or even the Knesset in uh, Jerusalem uh, um, or the prime minister house in uh, Balfour or a shopping mall, which means that the way that you have to prepare for those organization, those organizations is very different than the way that it used to work 20 years ago. Another problem with organizations in contrast to an army is the fact that they can switch from a mode of routine uh, for war in half a minute. And we uh, can't do it. We cannot. Uh, for the Israeli army, it will take longer. It will take longer uh, to prepare our army or to bring our reservers to the border fence. Um, so this is something that Israel acknowledged, and um, the decision that made that was made uh, was to change the whole security conception of the on the Golan Heights, which means we understand that we're facing for the near future mostly guerrilla warfare, which means infiltrators, booby traps, uh, shelling positions, shelling communities. Uh, things that the anti-tank ditch or the minefield probably won't stop. And uh, therefore, in 2012, Israel started to work on a border fence, a new fence, soon we'll see it. It's a fence uh, that replaced an old rusty fence that looked the same as the one that uh, circled my kibbutz. The new fence has motion sensors, video cameras, intelligent drones, bomber drones, and unmanned vehicles to troll along, which means it's indicative fence that can provide you indication of those ones that try to get close to or uh, try uh, to touch it. Um, besides that, uh, the units in the Golan were replaced. And instead of having here mostly the armor core, based on reserve. Today we have the regular army, the best unit. Israel has only one commando brigade. Part of it is here. Uh, we have other special forces. Many of them are here. Uh, in terms of the intelligence, changed completely, completely. Um, but also uh, in terms of the armor corps and the sophisticated artillery, which means that position that we just passed is one of those that has uh, cruise missiles. Uh, a missile that has a camera on the head controlled by a joystick. Shooting range changes between the different missiles, but for 40 miles to even more. Uh, uh, with an accuracy that you can get that missile into a very small window. And here we got back to another military road. There are foxes in front of us. So uh, the nature is here uh, also. Here, uh, the fox wanna, wanted to say hi. It's, high, it's right here. The foxes are not very shy. So oh, he's just looking, he or she. Um, and here we got into a closed military area. So I can't say that this area is secured by the foxes. 
uh, we have other forces. Uh, the reason that it's closed, part of it because of the fact that um, we have here different uh, intelligence devices. Uh, you can try to look at the camera uh, over there. So we have different sensors on, part of it connect to electronic warfare, part of it has different cameras looking into Syria. We're gonna get here to a nice spot on one of the bunkers and try to look when we still have daylight uh, into Syria. Uh, so uh, no one's supposed to shoot us here. Uh, things are uh, very quiet. So the cameraman can be relaxed. And uh, uh, but we're very close. Uh, so um, I would say that this border for me, you know, when I try uh, to think about this border, uh, this was the quietest we had in Israel. Nothing happened here. I have to say that when I served for the paratroopers, I never served here in the Golan Heights. It was very annoying for someone that lived here, but I never served in the Golan. And because uh, there was no need to have the paratroopers here. The border considers quiet. Why? You could see it in the... Mujahideen Square by the palace of the president in Damascus. Talk about the destruction of Israel and could make you to be very popular among your friends. But if you try to come here to the border in order to commit any kind of an attack, you would find yourself in one of the, let's call it seven stars hotel of the Syrian army without seeing the daylight for the rest of your life. Um, that's the way that things work there in Syria and not because of the because of having the regime, uh, uh, I don't know, with good relationship uh, with Israel or the love. It was mostly because of the fact that um, uh, Syria made a decision that having uh, terrorism along this border is bad for them. Part of it because of the fact that we're less than an hour drive from Damascus. Uh, the thing that changed that reality was mostly uh, the fact that the civil war in Syria began in March 2011. So let's get out and take a look. Excellent. So behind me, this is a typical bunker. When I say a typical bunker, you know, typical here for the Golan, we have almost a hundred. And all of them build very similar. Um, we have here those walls that build by rocks that attach by nets instead of concrete, made the wall to be a better shock observer. Uh, there are tunnels getting underground to a few different rooms. In heat. From there are other tunnels that um, get into the trenches, which connect between the, fire, uh, the firing positions. So, um, Let's take a look of the trenches. And I'm not sure that you can hear, but in the background, we can hear them calling to the prey in the mosque. So we got in the right time. So you can hear the prey. I'm not, I'm not sure how many of you speak Arabic, but um, um, they say there, uh, first of all, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah is the great. La Allah, 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 no God besides Allah. Muhammad, Rasul Allah. Muhammad is the prophet or the messenger of Allah. Hayya ala salat. Come to the pray. Hayya ala falah. Come to work the creator. Allah wakbar, Allah wakbar. So they will repeat it. But the thing that we hear now along, along this call to the pray, the adan, is something that, let's say, coming here three years ago, you couldn't hear. Because they said now, it's kind of been uh, 
being loyal to Ali, and Ali was the one that was loyal to uh, Allah. When I say Ali, this is Ali ibn Abi Talib, which was the son-in-law of Muhammad, that married with Muhammad's daughter Fatma. And according to the Shiites, only the descendants of Ali, which means people that have blood connection to Muhammad, can eventually replace the Prophet. This is something that you can hear only the Shiite saying, never the Sunnis, which means that Syria, a country of 23 million people before the civil war began, 74% of them were Muslim Sunnis. And in order to survive being Shiite, generally the Shiites are 12% of the Islam ones, 85% of the Muslims all over are Sunnis. In order to survive, they needed to do taqiyya which is in Arabic practically line in order to survive. They come and say, Wa'atiw Allah, obey God. Wa'atiw Rasul, obey your prophet. And mingle with the people among you. And that's what the Shiites used to do in Syria. Can be the Shiites, can be the Alawites. We'll talk about those different groups. And here seems like that the Shiites that live here over the border feel the confidence of coming and say, we are Shiites. And call like that, when everyone around can hear, and you can see different communities, different villages, even a city called the New Kunetra. That's something that here on live can demonstrate the demographic transformation that Syria eventually done. Um, regarding to the different communities here. So the mosque that we hear is the one there in Al Ahmadiyya. Most of the village is abandoned. You can see there are no lights inside the village. And where we see few lights in the new Kunetra. That's the city that replaced the old one, built in 76. There were 25,000 people that lived there in the new Kunetra. And it was controlled by 54 different Sunni militias coming from different backgrounds. Part of them wanted to protect the village. Others wanted to uh, turn Syria to something better, freedom fighters. And the others were jihadists, which means here right below us, the land was controlled by an organization that called Jabba the Nusra, assisting France, changed their name to Fatah Hasham, the conquest of Syria, changed the name again to Ayat Hasham, the Front for the Liberation of Syria, or you can just call them Al-Qaeda. And the southern part of the Golan, we had in a one clear day of August 2014, three different militias, al matna al-Islamiyya, Saraya al-Jihad, Shuhada al-Yarmouk, that decided to pledge their allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, and actually turned to be Daesh, the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. And uh, those were 3,000 fighters there by the southern part of the Syrian Golan. Um, Eventually, Israel managed to create relationship with few of those groups, of course, not with the radical ones, that based on humanitarian aid. Um, and we managed to keep that reality uh, since the beginning of the Civil War up to the 26th of July, 2018. And that was the point that the Syrian regime with the Russian Air Force and the different Shiite militias managed to recapture this land. So the good neighborhood project of the humanitarian aid, that's where it ended. And we found ourselves facing different units of the Syrian army here below us, uh, deploying most of their positions along the border. But I would say that from the first moment, we realized that not everything that looks like a duck, fly like a duck and quack like a duck is a duck. And we realized that among them, we have activists of Hezbollah, we have activists of, for example, Unit 840 of uh, the Al-Quds Force of Iran and, uh, and others which uh, in the kibbutz we'll talk about. The reality changed completely and the Israeli army needed to prepare for that. About different occasions, about the situation, about the way that Israel dealing with it, about the way that Iran got into Syria, about Syria today, we'll talk in the kibbutz. So now we're getting back to the Jeep starting to drive back to the dining room.
Okay, so here uh, another uh, place. Uh, just a few minutes more that we have uh, with the light. Another place that I wanted to show you uh, were, was the local headquarters of the Syrian army in the Golan uh, pre-67. So again, we're going to use these military roads in order to get there. We still have the foxes here around us. By the way, when you get to a place like this, uh, first you have to coordinate with the army in order to get a clearance, especially now once uh, it gets dark, so it's even more important. Um, and once we enter the area with their cameras, uh, they can confirm that this is my vehicle. And that's kind of a procedure. But once the farmers get in here, you can see, we're passing here, there's a gate on the side, and the patrol force, they were kindly uh, in order there, uh, to leave it open. And you will ask the farmer that work here also means like 200 yards from the border fence. Um, to ask him um, it's, what's the challenge of uh, working where you work. So uh, you will say, yeah, you know, this this winter was a little bit too long, and uh, the bees we had not enough bees in order to do pollination. Uh, so we might have less uh, apples. And um, that's the way that people think. So I try to disconnect you a little bit from the problematic situation there in Syria. But this is the way that we see it from a military perspective. Uh, you just have to remember that the people here uh, barely feel it. Uh, during the civil war, we experienced from time to time uh, spillover, which means uh, there was a change of artillery right here over the border fence. And um, from time to time, uh, things landed here. Um, the Israeli army could predict most of those attacks, uh, which went, I could say, attention, atten attention attacks. But um, uh, they could say, now we have groups fighting very close to the border and therefore, during this battle, which usually take place for something like two, three days, the farmers can't work here. They're forbidden from getting to their pills, but again, we're talking here about a few days only. Above us up on the mountain is one of the main intelligence position here in the area uh, with different units from different uh, mostly I would say technology units of intelligence. Different units that there was no need to have here before, before the civil war be, uh, began and before Iran got there into Syria, the uh, different weapons uh, they had. Um, so now on the way to the headquarters, a few words about uh, that place. Um, there were Israeli rumors, mostly Israeli, that uh, the place uh, was built as a hospital. Uh, eventually those rumors based on wrong translation from Arabic. Uh, once the structure built by the Soviets as the headquarters of the Syrian army uh, from 1960 to 62, uh, from that point, Israel knew that most of the decisions regarding to the front with Israel uh, were made 
Mir in the headquarters. Um, Ahmad Al Mir, the commander of uh, the Syrian front, was stationed here in the headquarters. Um, at the last day of the Six Day War, 10 of June 67, uh, when Golani Brigade, one of our infantry brigade, uh, got there uh, to the structure, they found in the second floor a map. The title of the map was Syria Janubia, uh, the south of Syria, the southern Syria. On the map, you could see the Upper Galilee, Mount Carmel, and Caesarea. Means what we call the Northern Israel, that's what they call the Southern Syria, and that was the plan to conquer during the Six Day War. So as John Lennon said, life happens while well, you are busy uh, making other plans. Things can change. And here on the right, Besides the vineyards of the kibbutz that we see in the background, we can see this memorial uh, for um, an Israeli spy that called Eli Cohen. Uh, the lock uh, symbolized the intelligence once Eli was the key. Um, and facing here where uh, most of the intelligence officer of Syria um, were stationed. Uh, words about uh, Ali Cohen, uh, I'm sure that part of you heard the story, it became very famous. When a spy turned to be famous, it's usually not from the good reasons. Um, so uh, um, Ali Cohen was born to a family that was originally uh, from Aleppo, from Syria. Uh, the family uh, decided to move to uh, Alexandria in Egypt during the First World War in 1917. Um, Ellie was born there in Alexandria in 1924. Uh, seems, seems like that since uh, his childhood, uh, he was very interested about Israel, wanted to learn as much as possible. Um, at home, he learned different languages, uh, not only the Egyptian Arabic dialect, dialect but also the Syrians and the Lebanese. He, heard, he uh, learned Greek, uh, a little bit of Italian, Spanish. Uh, so this guy was very talented. Uh, in 55, he was involved in one of Israeli operations uh, that failed in Egypt. Uh, he was stopped for interrogation. Other, uh, other two was ex were executed by hanging, and uh, Ellie found eventually not guilty, not guilty, and he uh, made a decision uh, two years after to do coming up to Israel. Decision made mostly after most of the Jewish population were expelled from Egypt. So he moved to Italy and from there uh, to Israel. And actually from the first days, Right after meeting his family that done that Aliyah to Israel in 49, Eli uh, wanted to join the intelligence. And, which means that those few operations and the, that work that he had in Egypt that wasn't enough for him. He wanted to be part of Unit 188, which a few years after turned to be the Israeli Mossad. Um, Eli uh, request uh, got rejected, and he started to live his normal his life in Israel as a normal person. And he got married. Uh, his wife uh, Nadia was pregnant with his first uh, child, his daughter Sophie. Then it seems like that something changed for the Israeli intelligence two years after, and they came to Ali and wanted him to serve for them. Um, it took a while for Ali to agree, but uh, eventually he did. And Ellie uh, decided uh, to start his training 
uh, the training took place for almost a year. Part of it, we call it those three months in the village, means you can have uh, fluent Arabic and uh, a lot of theoretical background about uh, the different people that you have uh, in this uh, destination that you're supposed to get to. But uh, without experiencing living among the families, uh, you can't really understand the culture. And without understanding the culture, you cannot serve the Israel intelligence. That's my opinion. Um, so Eli uh, had that training in uh, station after that in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, mingling with the Syrian community over there. And then um, uh, nine months after, uh, got into Syria. Uh, I think that what turned Eli to be such a brilliant spy was the fact that um, he made friends. Uh, those friends uh, were uh, generals in the Syrian army, ministers in the government, people that trusted him. How we got to the headquarters. So uh, obviously that was a closed military area then. And Eli uh, managed to make a connection with a guy that called Mausazar Adin. That guy was uh, the nephew of Abed al Karim Zar Adin, the Syrian uh, chief of staff. And um, getting the clearance from the chief of staff directly, he managed to get here to the Golan Heights mostly in order to see the hot springs of Hamad Gader in the southern part of the Golan, but also as a rich businessman that in Syria called Kamel Amin Thabet, um, maybe he will donate money to the Syrian army or to the different units or even to the soldiers that serve here. Um, when he came here to the Golan, he met a guy that called Muhammad bin Laden. Uh, he was a Saudi that uh, hired by the Syrians uh, for a national project of diverting the tributaries of the Jordan River. One of them still flows from Lebanon. The other one used to flow from Syria, from the Golan. There's another one which wasn't still in Israel. That wasn't an option. The idea was to divert them instead of flowing to the Jordan uh, to the Golan Heights by digging a canal of about 65 miles with three miles of bridges and tunnels with only one purpose of draining Israel. And um, that's when uh, Eli uh, heard about it for the first time. That's what Israel intelligence, as much as I know, uh, got the information for the first time. Um, and I think that this is one of the biggest contributions of Eli here in your service. Eventually, Eli was captured, executed by hanging, 65. Uh, he left here his wife, Nadia, and three children, Sophie, Yit, and Shai. And uh, the Syrians accused Eli for treason. This is something that interesting because eventually they knew that he was in Israel. So how come a treason? He was executed by saying in the which means uh, you betrayed your country. And um, Ali said in Arabic, Anamish Hayen Anamabus, which means I'm not a I'm not a traitor. I'm the messenger, messenger of my country. Um, why for the Syrians, they that consider that um, Eli eventually lived most of his life in Arab countries. Being born in Egypt and after that, uh, living among Syrians in Argentina and then living among Syrians in Syria. He said means what time you spent in Israel? You had those two years before joining the Mossad. So for them, it considered as treason 
in your uh, ethnicity, in the ethnic group that you belong to, being Arab, in your Aruba. Um, another thing that can give us an indication on this culture and how uh, they see things, from their perspective, the state that you are part of is not important. What important is the ethnic group that you belong to, the religion, your family, your tribe. These are the important things. We need to understand that as a background in order to understand the civil war taking place in Syria. And here we got to the kibbutz, so we'll, um, we'll talk about it. That okay. Okay, so uh, hi again. So I hope you enjoyed. Um, we just filmed this uh, just before it started to get dark here in the, in the kibbutz. And I have to say that we done that in a perfect time. For you it's morning, but here it was just the sunset and everything green here in the northern part of the Golan. And uh, we just thought about it that you drive 10 minutes and get a little bit lower and it's all dry and yellow some will say golden uh, but look very different so um i will try to explain here a very complicated situation that uh, started in syria on the 15th of march 2011 um, uh, which will bring us to understand why today the border with the different groups looks so complicated and uh, of course, I will try to talk also about uh, different things that we hear, part of them in the media, about Iran and ships and things like those. So uh, and the nuclear and and now the uh, the JCPOA that uh, U.S. might uh, resign on. So uh, so let's start. So I would say that first of all, in order to understand the situation in Syria, we need to understand something very simple. Syria is not very special which means that, sorry for the Syrians, and I hope that they can't hear me, but um, we look in most of the countries in the Middle East from Gibraltar Strait, getting to Morocco and all the way east to the Pakistani and Indian border. And we eventually gonna see that most of those countries are failed countries, leaders that didn't manage to provide their people the basic needs of bread um, um, and hope and work, um, and um, as one of the Syrians told me, once you find yourself struggling on a daily basis to put bread on the table and you understand that your son and your grandson and your grand grandson will live in the same way, that's the point that you understand that you have nothing to lose. And uh, that's the answer uh, that they gave when I asked them, how come someone like you that worked in a past office and in that time was hospitalized in Israel, um, how come someone like you decided to leave everything to risk his family to get out of the street once we know that it's not like in Israel? People here can protest against the government. They can protest in front of the house of the prime minister and they will get to the day of tomorrow. Not in Syria. And uh, most of those that I asked said, very simple, we lost hope. Um, and I think that that's the situation in most of the Middle East. It got into Syria with a kid, 13 years old, his name was Hamza al-Hatib, son of farmers that lost the land cause of lack of water. And I have to say he wasn't the only. Syria then, a country of 23 million people, uh, once almost a third of the population lived under the poverty line, 20% unemployed, and almost half of the population was under the age of 19 years old, which means in a simple map, the population doubled itself in a period of 30 years. They needed water. They got the water from two main rivers, the Euphrates that flows from Turkey and the Rantes that flows from Lebanon. So guess what? The Turks decided to dam the Euphrates, part of the struggle that they have with the Kurds that live in the northern part of Syria. But eventually this was the main source of water for Syria. Added to the fact that since 03, when US got into Iraq, it eventually brought and, 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 and Saddam Hussein regime um, um, that, was that got replaced, eventually brought to a wave of refugees getting from Iraq into Syria. 
In addition to that, from 06 up to 09, we had drought. We, we felt it here in Israel, here in the kibbutz, we looked for alternatives. In Syria, we're talking about 2006, 7, 8, and 9, a country that based on agriculture and had almost no rain. And it eventually brought many farmers to have no other option but to do an urbanization, moving to the cities, looking for jobs, which most of them didn't manage to find. Four and a half million people found themselves living in tents or temporary housing surrounding the cities. You got a very good reason for an uprising. And that kid, Hamza El Khatib, spread graffiti on the walls there of a city called Dara. We're talking about an hour and a half drive from here on the Jordanian border, writing in Arabic, Yalla Erhal Ya Bashar, get out of here, Bashar, Bashar al Assad, the president of Syria. The child disappeared. A few days after that body returned to the parents in the worst condition you can imagine. That was the 15th of March. That's how things started. Gradually, we started to see a war taking place in Syria. How come? Let's talk about the ethnic and the religious structure of Syria. 74% of them were Muslim Sunnis, the rest minorities, Kurds, Shiites, Circassians, Druze, Christians, and the minority that run the country called themselves Alawite. The president is an Alawite. When he ordered the army to shoot those guys that protested in the streets, he ordered the Alawite generals but the Alawite generals needed to give the order to the Sunni soldiers. And the Sunni soldiers were ordered to shoot their own people. What's called in Arabic, Elmina, one of ours, part of my family, part of my tribe, part of my ethnic group, for my religion. And many of them defected and formed different militias of rebels. In a matter of months, we found ourselves facing 85% of our border controlled by different militias of rebels. At the peak, 54 different militias of rebels that we mentioned there in the, in the bunker. And gradually that was the situation. We got used to see rebels over the fence. A tiny piece of the fence was controlled by the Syrian regime with Shiite militias joining them. And eventually Assad, the president, lost faith, lost trust in his own army. And that's when he brought his Shiite friends. And since 2013 into 2014, Israel started to see Iranian presence in Syria. Usually not the Iranians themselves that were sent to fight there against different rebels groups, but Shiites that the Supreme Leader managed to bring from Afghanistan that speak Pashto and from Pakistan, Shiites that speak Urdu, or from Iraq, different militias as Isaib Ali Haq, Liwa Zul Fikar, Liwa Fadil Abbas, Imam Al Hassan, Hezbollah Al Bayt, Hezbollah Katab, Hezbollah Harakat Al Nushava, Hajj Al Shabi, and many others. And we found ourselves eventually facing here a situation that Shiites supposedly fight against Sunnis and Sunnis fight against Shiites. But seems like that that was the camouflage that eventually helped, helped Iran to build a war machine that can be used and probably we depend on them will be used against Israel. The Iranian rationale is very simple. This is a country that wanna build their empire. And what gives them the confidence of building the empire is the nuclear capability they're trying to achieve. They understand that Israel is the main obstacle in order to get there. And therefore Iran trying to do to Israel the same as North Korea done to South Korea. South Korea understand that if North Korea is going to be under attack on the day after Seoul won't be existed. Iran come in and say, if someone will attack our nuclear reactors, we will destroy Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, not by launching the missile from Tehran to Tel Aviv, but from Damascus, from Beirut, from Gaza, from the western part of Iraq, and even from the northern Yemen. And that's the situation that today we're facing in Syria. Today, most of our border is controlled by the Syrian army together with different Shiite militias that affiliated with Iran. We have Hezbollah on the Lebanese border and many challenges that Israel is trying to fight against, part of it by war between the wars, by trying to prevent from our enemies to have better capabilities that will bring themselves to a better stunning point in the next war. And by doing that, we hope to postpone that war. And part of it by other um, things, but I would say that the quietest border we had in Israel today gradually turning to be more and more challenging. So um, I will leave here um, enough time, I hope, 
uh, for questions. Uh, so uh, feel free. Thank you so much, Elon. That was absolutely incredible as, as we knew and as, as we thought. I appreciate uh, you coming back to the kibbutz and taking time to, to answer some questions. I was just thinking most of the questions we've got, you covered because I know you've, you've done this a few times so you know what we're all thinking. Um, but we do, have a, we do have a specific question. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do a couple questions, but one specific one is about them. We hear a lot in the United States, especially uh, in the Jewish community, we hear a lot about the, the missile threat from Hezbollah, mainly coming from the Lebanese, you know, from Southern Lebanon. What's the prognosis these days and how do you and your communities deal with that and work with the army? What's, what's, what's the status of that? Okay, so in this case, I think that most of Israel feel that that's eventually a failure of, of Israel as a state with the army um, for this situation that we're facing, having an organization that today armed by 150,000 missiles and rockets that can reach anywhere in Israel. And I think that part of this um, conflict between the wars in Syria is by trying to, uh, of preventing them from replicating that model that succeeded so well in uh, Lebanon. Um, we see also in Syria that they try to work in the same way. In Lebanon, they use people as human shield in a way that a couple get married, Hezbollah coming to them and say, okay, we're gonna pay for the house, but this room, leave it for us. In Syria, we said most of the people are Sunnis, but many of those people need that money. And in the same way that Hezbollah can do it in Lebanon, and in that case, mostly for being Shia, it's working with other Shia, it's living in the Southern part of Lebanon, in Syria, they try to use money. They try to use drugs. They try to use the fact that 90% of the Syrians live under the poverty line today. So if an average salary of $200 reduced to $17 and Hezbollah or other organizations there affiliated with Iran in Syria can pay $50 or $100, those people will do everything you ask. And we saw the situation, the last occasion that we had here along the border, um, those were four guys, three of them were shepherds that we knew. Shepherds that tried to put a booby trap on the border fence in the same place that Israel had a field hospital two years before. A place they already knew. The plan was to kill 15 Israeli soldiers. Those shepherds were from families that got medical treatment from Israel. So how come those guys decided to, I won't say switch sides because they were never on our side, but to fight against Israel after Israel saved their friends or family um, relatives lives? Mostly because of the fact that they have no choice. Those guys can be Sunnis, Shiites will pay them, and they will do it for the money, not for the ideology. So this is the situation that we're concerning so much. I would say that in Lebanon, this is a strategic decision that have to be made by the Israeli government. In the case of Syria, the decision already made, and I hope that Israel will continue with that, a decision that we won't let Iran to establish their presence in Syria. Great, thank you. So maybe I'll, I'll ask kind of like a two-part wrap-up question, because again, you've really given us a ton of information really bringing us up to date on what's happening, not just for the kibbutzim and what you guys deal with every day, but obviously the whole regional situation. Uh, but the most transformative thing that's occurred right in the last year has been the Abrahamic Accords. And we all know that a lot of, one of the reasons that happened was Israel making agreements with mainly Sunni countries was due to the uh, increased Iranian threat, the increased Iranian uh, presence in the region. I'm curious if you see an impact and if it's changed anything in Syria, given some of those cooperations, and then maybe what that means for the prognosis in Syria moving forward. Okay, so um, so I think that this, you know, usually there are two Israelis arguing and at least three opinions, we always say, and here there's quite a consensus in Israel that was very important, important, but it's very important politically 
economically, but in terms of defense, I cannot expect that Israeli F-35s will take off from the airport of Abu Dhabi to attack in Iran. It won't happen. If Israelis think that we managed to create a parallel crescent to the Shiite controlling this area from the Persian Gulf through Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. So this is something that we, we made now the Sunni crescent from the Mediterranean, Mediterranean crossing Israel into Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the Amorites. That's not the situation. I heard one of the diplomats in Abu Dhabi come in and say, Israel have to destroy Hezbollah. Of course, we will destroy Hezbollah. We're going to pay by the blood of our soldiers for a problem that we share with the Emirates eventually, or with the Saudis. Eventually, who's the one that trained the Houthis uh, and armed the Houthis in Yemen that bombed Saudi Arabia now in the past few weeks on a daily basis? That's Hezbollah. On the other hand, we didn't manage to get to the complexity of the different groups that we have now along the border in the past few months. But I would say briefly here that many of those groups that we have on the other side want to live their lives peacefully. Many of them got medical treatment from Israel, and many of them are rebels that have left uh, being unemployed. And um, those guys, the main problem is that they have no one leadership and they have no economic resources. One of the things that they ask from the Amorites to do, it's to arrange that part, the economic part. And the Amorites agreed, but they said eventually all those problems taking place, first of all, by the Israeli border. And therefore, maybe we're going to give the money, but it's going to be through Israel. And this is something amazing, which means we have here a real opportunity in Syria to create a force that first of all will defend itself, but by defending itself, they will create a buffer between us and the differentiate militias. And the thing is that we have also Russia being on the Syrian regime side that willing to support that. It's not exactly supporting all those rebels, but they're willing to support different units of locals that will serve for the Syrian army. They call it Brigade 8, that eventually commend by, commanded by a guy that called Ahmad al uda This guy was part of the Syrian army once, defected from the Syrian army, was trained by the CIA in Jordan. After that, decided to get from a moderate rebel to be a radical one, join Al-Qaeda, and then got back to the free Syrian army, lost three of his brothers in one of the battles against the Syrian army. And today he's the commander for the Russians on one of the units of the Syrian army that mostly hired there and training different locals here. So that's an opportunity to create a force that's gonna be or neutral or even pro-Israel with the help of the Amorites, something that we won't be able to do by ourselves. So this is just one example of a way to cooperate in terms of defense. Wow, okay, that's pretty incredible, pretty, pretty transformative. So look, I'm sure you and I, and there's a lot more to go into, we could, we could talk for hours, um, but we are, gonna, we are gonna wrap up our, our Zoom experience. It's been you know, an hour and 15 minutes. We so appreciate you taking us once again on that incredible Jeep ride, showing us that drone footage of the region. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Uh, we had a great group uh, joining us this, this morning here in LA. I wanna thank again, our travel partners, World Express Travel, IGT, and of course, uh, Elon and his crew over in Israel for taking us. And the only thing left to say is next time, Elon, we'll be back on the Jeep with you. So we hope to see you very, very soon. Uh, and I wanna thank you and thank everybody for joining us. Looking forward. Thank you for all, all uh, for joining us. Take care.